Hi class, Dr. Jim here. In this lecture, we're going to look at sexual reproduction. And so we're going to take the time and look at how do animals have sex and then basically why do they have sex. And so kind of looking at the difference between asexual and sexual reproduction. Asexual, again, is typically a clone of the parent, so you don't get any genetic diversity in that, which is fine because you can produce lots of numbers very quickly. But sexual reproduction allows you to mix the genes. And so you need to have separate sexes so that the genes can mix so that you put these things together and you actually um, come up with two, you come up with a variety of offspring. And again, that allows for uh, better survival for environmental changes than that. And so that's kind of why sexual reproduction has been the uh, go-to in the higher level uh, vertebrates in this case, and even invertebrates in these situations, because it does provide some uh, benefit for variation. And again, uh, a lot of times when we think of sexual reproduction, we're only thinking of humans in that. But again, all animals have some type of reproduction, whether it be asexual or sexual. And this just kind of shows you a couple of different ways. Some have internal fertilization. Others have uh, external fertilization. And again, they both produce one or the other. So the female releases eggs while the male produces sperm and then releases in the water. Frogs are very similar in that way, where again, the male kind of mounts the female in this case. She releases eggs and the male will fertilize them as they're being released. Now, in certain insects, they have sometimes internal fertilization. And so again, the male may uh, insert the sperm into the female and then uh, they get internal fertilization and then release uh, fertilized eggs after that. And then when we look at the mammals, mammals have internal fertilization and internal development. And so not only do you get a fertilization going on inside, but again, then you get development of the eggs. And we're going to look at development in a separate uh, lecture uh, later on the semester. And so again, I know in your chapter 36, they talk about development, but we're going to put that to the end and kind of look at that as a last kind of last thing, because there's a lot of interesting things there. And I think for now, we'll just cover the process of at least getting the egg fertilized in that by the sperm and then looking at that and then looking at development further down the line and kind of going through those different things. Okay, so today we're just going to talk about fertilization, getting getting to the reproduction of the animal, and then later on we'll look at development down the line. All right, so that's what we're looking at. So again, well, first thing we're going to talk about is the difference between asexual and sexual reproduction. Again, asexual is going to be a clone of the parent where sexual is going to be the mixing of the genes between two parents. And so we'll look at that as well. We'll look at some of the specific organs needed for reproduction, not only in humans, but also in other animals as well. So we'll do some a little bit of comparative anatomy, but it's pretty much the same in when, when we're thinking about mammals in those situations. And then we'll look at what roles do hormones play in mammal reproduction. And again, kind of look at what triggers this response. And one of the big differences in a lot of mammals is that in humans, we can be reproductive pretty much every month and almost any time, really. In other, in other mammals, they have periods where they essentially go into what we call heat. They become re, uh, reproductively active, and then they lose that over, over a period of days. And then typically it's very seasonal, where they may only mate once a year or maybe twice a year and that stuff. And so you'll see some differences. Humans, humans and some other primates are a little bit different in that, that we can pretty much reproduce at any time, whereas with most mammals, they have uh, periods of time during the year when they when they meet and reproduce and those things. Okay, so again, let me count the ways. So in this situation here, you're seeing the sea slugs uh, producing sperm and eggs and that they act as both the mother and father to the generation. A lot of times we call this, or we call this hermaphroditism, where essentially you have both organs, both the male and female. And why that's important is that you don't have to go searching for the opposite sex. You basically just find two sea slugs and they can mate with one another no matter what they are because they both have the male and female parts. And so one becomes the male for one of the animals, one becomes the female for the other and vice versa. And so you see that. And again, looking at that, the idea of why we reproduce is so that the population will outlive the members by reproduction. And so to be biologically successful, we need to pass our genes on to the next generation. That's the idea whenever we think about uh, reproduction in general. Now, again, sexual reproduction is the creation of offspring by the fusion of sperm and egg. And so think of mixing of the 
Mixing of the genes to form a zygote where asexual is the creation of offspring without fusion of egg and sperm and typically is done through mitosis. So we think of sexual reproduction through meiosis where again you reduce the number of chromosomes and then you fuse them back together to get the full complement set. Where asexual you're going to do mitosis where you're either going to do budding or fragmentation or other things. And so you see a difference in there. And so this kind of just shows you the difference. Here's a C anemone by uh, basically dividing into two, whereas here's sexual, where again, you have a male and female, well, both male and females fertilizing each other and producing uh, the new offspring from there using a mixing of the genes in those cases. Now, in many invertebrates, they reproduce by budding. And so probably the classic example is the hydra. And again, you can see that this is just a clone. This is all done through mitosis, and eventually this will bud off, break off, and form a new adult that has, is genetically the same as this guy. And so you can see a couple of different ways that actually asexual reproduction can occur. And again, these are typically in uh, lower end invertebrates. So we think of like binary fission where you can grow and you start to grow large enough that you split into two. We have budding where again you can form the adult by creating a new adult off the side and then fragmentation is basically breaking things apart and so you chop the arms off the starfish and again they can form new things. Same thing with the worm if you sliced it in half you could create new new worms that way and all these are examples of asexual reproduction because they share the same genes as the adult or as the parent in this situation so there's really no difference between parents and adults. This is a video, again, if you want to take a look and watch the video, my player is not working, so uh, I'm not going to waste the time to look at it. But if you want to see how budding takes place, you can watch this video on the PowerPoint and take a look at that and, and see. And I, I think I've included this before when we talked about the Hydra uh, back, back a couple weeks ago, looking at that. Now, again, fragmentation is the breaking of the body into pieces. And a lot of times you have regeneration, which is regrowth of lost body parts. And so that's going to be this here, where again, you can fragment the worm and now you can develop all new worms where they regenerate all their body parts in this case. Now, parthogenesis is the develop of a new individual from an unfertilized egg. So again, in parthogenesis, we can use things like chemicals or electricity or other stimulants that can actually stimulate and fertilize the egg. And so what we do in this situation, so this would be in humans, what they can do is take the polar body from the female and then actually fertilize the female egg using the polar body. And again, stimuli lighting that and then creating an early embryo. And again, it would have all 46 because again, what happens when you take the polar body, which would have 23, and then the egg nucleus that has 23, you put those together and you make 46. Now, in those situations, it's going to be more of a clone, but there could be some variance again because of crossing over and other things through meiosis and that stuff. So there may be some variation, but in, the, in those situations, in parthogenesis, you're going to see more, uh, more like the adult because there's going to be less genetic uh, variation in those situations. And so sometimes you see parthogenesis in certain reptiles and that as well, where all the species are female and they go through asexual reproduction in that. And again, that's where the polar body fuses with the nucleus and, and the egg nucleus and then forms the 46 chromosomes. And we'll talk about that here in just a minute where that can actually occur. Now, the difference between sexual and or sexual reproduction and asexual is the, the twofold cost. So when we look at asexual reproduction, what that will allow you to do is that essentially every organism is going to be female because they can reproduce anyways. And so what you do is you create clones of a new generation. Okay, and so you're creating clones. And so what's nice about asexual and the reason why a lot of younger animals and other organisms use asexual is because you can get very large numbers very quickly. And so it works for bacteria. It works for a lot of the protists and again, some of the invertebrate animals because you can develop lots of animals very quickly because it doesn't require a lot of energy. And you can see any animal would be capable of doing it. And so the numbers increase twofold in that situation. And so the only issue with that is that they're all genetically the same. And so the only way that you get genetic variation is there's some type of mutation or selection pressure that relates to mutations in those situations. And so in those types of species, you have to produce lots and lots of numbers. And again, asexual works very well. But if you have an environmental change, let's say that a big asteroid comes down and hits and wipes out the environment, 
then all these species that, and if the adult's going to die, the kids and the offspring are going to die as well. Now, in sexual reproduction, you have uh, two things that are going on. First, the female may produce males, and you require a male for a reproduction, and so that's one of the limits. And so it's a loss because this male does not reproduce or make offspring, and so the male is just there to fertilize the egg. And so that's one of the reproductive losses. And so, again, each generation, you may be producing one female, one male. And, of course, we know that you can produce more than one female child, but we're just looking at it in the general sense. The other thing that you see is that you're producing genetic variation because you're mixing male genes with the female genes, and so you're going to get variation. And so the offspring is going to look different than the parent, and they may have a selective advantage over the parent in case an environmental change happens. And so this is why most species have now moved to sexual reproduction for the survival of the species. And so again, that's, uh, again, when we look at eukaryotes, we look at sexually because you get more more variation, more likelihood of survival. And so again, even in invertebrates, they select sexual reproduction over asexual most of the time due to this variation. And so again, makes it a more stable population. You have variants and then they can survive and do these different things. So that mixing of the genes is very important for, for this to happen. Okay, and so that's the issue there. Now again, sexual reproduction results in the offspring of varied genotypes and just showing you the kittens, this is from the same parents, and you can see the variants in the in the kittens here. You got one with the white chest and these cute little kitten here. You got one that's orange or calico. You got another one that's got the kind of the chocolate brown chest, another calico, and then you got another tiger striped here. And again, all of them look slightly different. And again, they have different personalities, different traits, all these different things. And again, it enhances the survival chances of the offspring to survive an environmental change. And that's gonna be the key in that stuff, having the reproductive success. And so variants are an important thing when we think about variants. Now again, most animals exhibit a reproductive cycle related to changing seasons, and the reproductive cycles are controlled by hormones and environmental cues. And again, this is common when we think of, let's look at the, so this is the deer population. So right now, between September and early November, this is essentially mating season. And so we call in males, it's called the rut. You can see testosterone going up and then the estrus cycle going uh, higher here in the deer. And so during this time, now the males are fighting over the females and you get reproduction taking place. And so then by May and June, you have the baby deer in this case. And so you have the calves in those situations. And so it typically goes by the seasons. So this is why you see a lot of car deer accidents right now because the males are out looking for the females to reproduce. And so again, their testosterone's at the highest at this point, they're more aggressive at this point, and that, and they're looking to inseminate the females. Females are responsive, they have their estrus cycle at this point, so they're receptive to reproduction. They get pregnant, and then by May and June of the next year, they have the calves. And so you can kind of see how this goes on. And so that's one of the explanations of why you typically see this is due to pregnancy and parental care and that stuff is that they don't want to be reproducing over and over again so that they have time to do parental care and other other situations. Now, not all mammals do this, but it's very common in a lot of the mammals that we do see out there. Humans being one that don't follow this cycle and that humans can really almost get pregnant at any time. And so again, except when they're uh, pregnant themselves, but that, that doesn't even actually stop then. So there could be a possibility. Typically, the body does take a break from ovulating during pregnancy. But there have been rare occasions where people have gotten pregnant while they were pregnant already because they do ovulate and that stuff. It's very rare, but it has happened. And so it can happen that way in seeing those types of things. Now, in the reproductive cycles, like I said, there are some situations that do parthogenesis. And in this case, we're looking at these whiptail lizards. Now, they still, even though all the groups are female, what you see is that they still have mating rituals and male mating behavior where the female will mount another female and kind of go through the through the customs of mating, even though they kind of go through parthogenesis. And what happens is that in one uh, scent of ovulation, the female on the bottom will be the female and on top will have more male characteristics. 
Then what happens is the next time through ovulation, now the man or the female that was on top will now become the mating, and then the other female will do display the male characteristics. And again, they don't do any sexual reproduction. It's not like this lizard then starts producing sperm and inseminating the female. It's just kind of the behavior that they have. And what happens is you have parthogenesis where, again, the egg gets fertilized by, again, the polar body. And then you have more of an asexual type of reproduction rather than uh, sexual reproduction where you have the mixing of the genes. And so that's one of the things that happened there. And again, this may have developed due to the lack of males and that stuff. So maybe there was a, a climate change where the males were uh, lacked out, or, you know, didn't... Uh, happened or you know weren't there or maybe in small numbers and they got destroyed and so the females had to figure out ways to uh, give offspring and so this may have ar arose during that time as a natural evolution. This is also the thing that happened in Jurassic Park so again they talked about how they made sure that uh, uh, reproduction couldn't happen they only bred females well some lo and behold females learned how to lay eggs and that stuff and so they probably went through something like this either Either one evolved into have more male-like characteristics so they could do that, or they did this thing called parthogenesis. And I, they didn't really explain what happened, but as Jeff Goldblum, as his character said, nature always finds a way. And so when reproduction happens, there's always a way for these things to reproduce. And so and probably in this situation, nature found a way to either do parthogenesis or, like I said, changing the male uh, females into male behavior in those situations like that. So that's the thing. Okay, so again, uh, there are situations where uh, some species have both male and female reproductive systems, and we call that hermaphroditism, and essentially that's just so that they don't have to go searching for another mate. So they don't have to find a specific male or female to mate with. They can just find another worm or another species, another one of their species to mate with. And so this is just showing you where hermaphrodites mate and they can even self-fertilize, so they don't even have to find a mate sometimes. In this case, this is just showing you the worm reproductum. I talked about the clotellum before when we dissected the earthworm. These are used to bind the worms together, and then it makes this mucus layer where the sperm can travel down and reproduce. And so you have the male pores, which are the seminal uh, vesicles, which release the sperm, and then the receptacles on each will receive the sperm, fertilize the eggs, and then you have reproduction taking place. And so again, both of them can reproduce that way. Now in this one, this is kind of like what I was talking about with uh, Jurassic Park. There are situations where you have males that are kind of have these broods where they, again, defend, uh, defend a group of females. So they have this large harem of female fishes in this case. And so what happens if the male dies, let's say he gets an attack with another male and that male dies, well, the largest of the female in that group will take over, get male characteristics, and now fertilize the rest of the females and kind of make be become the male of the situation of that harem. And so it's interesting that this can happen. And so again, these fish can then begin to produce sperm instead of eggs. And so again, it's another biological thing where again nature finds a way and so this might have what they it might have been what they were talking about in Jurassic Park where the one of the females became more male like and was able to fertilize the eggs in this situation again in fish it's a little bit different because they do all external fertilization whereas in dinosaurs or in larger animals if you're talking about reptiles or birds the male they do internal fertilization so again they'd also have to get male characteristics like uh, way to deposit the sperm into the female for internal fertilization and again we'll talk talk more about the structures needed here in a little bit. Now again uh, sexual reproduction requires fertilization again the un union of sperm and eggs. External fertilization is shed where the uh, females lay eggs. Males then spread sperm over that and it basically happens in an external environment. So typically what we see external fertilization is in all varieties of fish which are in the water, so both the sharks and the um, sharks and the bony fish again, and then you also see a lot of times in the amphibians. Now, higher level vertebrates like the reptiles, the birds, and the mammals will do more like internal fertilization, and again, they have receptors that were not receptors, but they have receptacles in that that allow for internal fertilization, and so they have developed uh, organs that allow for. Uh, sperm and egg to come in contact with each other inside the animal itself. And so that would be internal fertilization and looking at that. 
Now, again, in a moist habitat, it's always required for external fertilization to prevent the gametes from drying out and allow sperm and eggs. Here you can see a sponge releasing sperm into the water, and again, another sponge somewhere else may be releasing eggs. Uh, again, in other uh, inverters, may simply shed gametes into the surrounding water. So here you have the male and female frog releasing eggs. Here are the eggs being released into the water. And then, again, the males releasing sperm at the same time to fertilize those eggs. And then, again, in the case, timing of releasing gametes is crucial to ensure that the sperm and egg encounter each other. The other thing you're going to see uh, with this is that you're going to have large numbers of these things because, again, it's more about chance. You're going to see a lot of male or a lot of eggs being released and a lot of uh, sperm being released. And, again, when we dissected the frog in class, you saw that there were thousands upon thousands of eggs. And the reason for that is that only a few will actually make it to adulthood. And because there's very little parental care, essentially once these get released in the water, the male and female go away, and then the tadpoles are on their own. And so same thing with the sponges or anything else that do external fertilization. Internal fertilization, you're going to have more parental care associated with it and taking care of the young. And so again, this is typically associated by producing fewer gametes, but the survival is a higher fraction of zygotes. And again, either through eggs that are protected by the male or female, and then internal fertilization is also associated by providing protection for embryos and parental care of the young. And so you see uh, parent and offspring, uh, again, one another, uh, protecting one another. And so when you see that, then you see uh, these offspring can make it so there's fewer and fewer zygotes actually being produced during uh, reproduction. So that's the key there as well. And so that's another thing that you tend to see. Now, again, the embryos of some terrestrial animals develop in eggs with calcium and protein containing shells and several internal membranes, again, to keep them alive, while others retain the embryo which developed inside the female. And again, parental care helps ensure the survival of the offspring. And so here you see an insect actually carrying the eggs and the embryos on their back. And so it's kind of gross, but you do see this quite a bit, especially with spiders and ticks and that stuff, where they're actually taking care of their offspring until they're ready to hatch and then they get released in those situations. So again, something you don't want to really think about, but it does happen quite a bit with the parental care. And again, parental care is going to have, or at least parental care of the embryos is going to make sure that more embryos survive to the um, to the to developing into the regular animal now some reproductive organs and transport gametes and again sexual reproduction in animals rely on sets of cells that are precursors to eggs and sperm and again we're going to be talking about these structures so again we have the egg cells that develop in the ovaries and then you have the sperm cells that develop in the testes and again in most mammals they have the same structures they have the ovaries or the uh, testes that allow for the production of sperm and egg, and we'll look at this as we go on. Now, in many but not all animals have gonads, and these are organs that produce the gametes. And some simple systems do not have gonads, but the gametes are formed from undifferentiated tissue. And so again, looking at the levels, so if we talk about sponges, they do sexual reproduction and they can produce uh, sperm and egg from undifferentiated tissue. And again, sponges don't even have tissue, they just have cells, and so these cells can be produced and then released. And I showed you the picture of the sperm being released, and same thing happens with eggs. Now, more elaborate systems include sets of accessory tubes and glands that carry and nourish and protect gametes. We know in humans we have a very distinct set of your genital system that allows for the nourishment and production of sperm and then also nourishment and production of the eggs. And so again, we talk about this and looking at these systems. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about these systems here as we go along in a couple minutes. Now again, most insects have separate sexes with a complex reproductive system. So again, a lot of them do do internal fertilization. You can see here in fruit flies, they do have uh, testes and they do have ovaries. So that's one of the things that they do have. And again, they may, uh, they may have sperm that can be kept alive for extended periods where they can actually hold on to the sperm so that they can be used over and over again for fertilizing eggs and not this one time that happens. So that can happen there. Now, other things that can happen or other systems that are uh, involved is the cloaca. And again, we saw this with the frogs, but this is typical of frogs and birds and reptiles where they share a common opening. And so again, this is a common opening to the external environment, including digestive, excretory, and reproductive systems. And again, 
The cloaca is common in non-mammalian vertebrates and mammals usually have separate openings. But in this case, we saw in the frog that they had not only their urinary bladder, but the, uh, the, either the eggs or the ovaries uh, depositing through the oviducts into the cloaca and then the large intestine as well, so the stomach. This is very similar to reptile and burn sperm passages where again, you have the testes, the ducts, the mesenteric ducts that go into the cloaca. You have the kidney emptying into the cloaca along with the um, uh, intestines going into the cloaca. So again, a lot of animals will share the same opening for all these things to happen. And again, uh, in females, the cloaca will also act, especially if they do, uh, in this case, not in the frogs, but in the reptiles and sperms, since or in, in bird, they will have larger cloacas in the females to actually collect the sperm. And so that's how they actually, you don't see a penis, but what you see is that the uh, male will release sperm from the cloaca, and then the female will have kind of a larger cloaca to actually catch the sperm so it can travel up the uh, travel up the, uh, um, I'm sorry, the, the oviduct to fertilize the eggs internally. And so that's what you see there and looking at those things. Okay. So now we come back to the human male reproductive in the, in the males. And so again, most mammals are this way where they actually have a penis and vagina to, uh, accept these things. And so that's what we're going to look at here. So I'm using the human uh, uh, species obviously to look at these things but again it's very similar to what we'd see in dogs and cats and and other mammals that kind of have the same type of organ system and so again looking at these different structures and and thinking this is very common in the mammalian species so the males external reproductive organs are called the scrotum and the penis and again the internal organs are the gonads that produce the sperm and the reproductive hormones along with the glands that make semen and that stuff and so you can see the tissue here and so again the testes are responsible for making the sperm that will travel up through past the bladder and go into the seminal vesicle which is or the seminal vesicle which adds uh, fluid to it you then have the um the tube connecting so this doesn't actually go into the bladder this goes around the bladder and then it reaches the uh, essentially the prostate gland where again there's more uh, fluid where it becomes in contact with the urethra, then enters the urethra, and then out through the penis. And so that's typically the movement of sperm and where it goes from there. And we'll talk a little bit more about that here in just a second. So again, the testes are where the sperm is produced. And so here you can see the testes in the structure. They're a tubule structure. And again, we'll look at uh, gametogenesis here in a little while. But essentially, this is where the sperm is made in, this, in these tissues. The tissues then make the sperm, where the sperm then enters these tubules and then work their way and are held in the in the epididymis. And so this is kind of essentially where the sperm is held once it's made, and then during the time of ejaculation or during the time of sex, what happens is the sperm will work its way up the vas deferens and then up to again to the uh, prostate, where it then enters into the urethra. Now, one of the functions of the scrotum is to maintain the body temperature a little lower. So again, this is to maintain the production of sperm. And so sperm, in order to may, or be produced properly, it has to be about a little bit cooler than normal body temperature. And so this is one of the reasons for the scrotum is to allow for the testes to hang down and be cooler than the normal body temperature. And so that's one of the things that they say in infertility that men should uh, try wearing boxers, again, to lower the testes to keep them cooler so that the production of sperm can happen more efficiently and better at better temperatures than, than um, if it was different underwear pushing up against the body to make it a little warmer. Now from the, from the tubules, so again, the seminiferous tubules of the testes sperm pass to the epididymis. And again, the epididymis is kind of where the sperm are being held during this time. Let me get my pointer here. So again, the testes are here. The epididymis is the holding, and then it works its way out the vas deferens. And again, during sexual arousal, the sperm will travel up, and then it will make it to the prostate where it comes in contact with the urethra. So this canal here, the vas deferens connects in. You will also see some of these other things uh, like the ejaculatory duct of the urethra going in. So that's where, again, the sperm come in, but you also have these other glands, and we'll talk about that here in a second, including the seminal vesicle 
in the bulbothereal gland, ethereal gland, along with the prostate, which adds to the secretions, which are adding nutrients and other things in, in, in the solution called semen, along with the sperm, which are ejaculated out during sexual reproduction. Now, semen is composed of sperm plus secretions of the three sets of glands. The two seminal vesicles contribute about 60% of the total volume. Again, it's typically just a sugar, sugary mixture of glucose and fructose that help feed the sperm on their journey to the egg. There's also the prostate gland that uh, secretes pro uh, products directly into, uh, into the urethra. And again, those, some of those are to help neutralize acid of the vagina as well as other things, providing nutrition to the sperm. And then you have the bulbal euthereal glands, which uh, secrete a clear mu uh, mucus before that neutralizes the acidic urine uh, remaining in the urethra. So kind of getting it ready for the ejaculation part of the sperm so that the sperm can survive not only the male uh, urethra, but also the female vagina in this case. And so again, that's some of the things that you see in these situations. And so again, starting in the testes, goes into the epididymis through the vas deferens, then out through the urethra and then out the penis. And then, like I said, you add these glands, which add again, secretions to that to make semen. And then that whole product is released during uh, ejaculation. Now, the human penis is composed of three cylinders of erectile tissue. Again, they fill with blood to get erect. And then again, during sexual arousal, erection, uh, erectile tissue fills with blood from the arteries called an erection. And then the head of the penis or the glands is typically uh, a thinner skin than the covering of the shaft. And again, that's the erectile tissue. And then the prepus or the foreskin is a fold of skin covering the glands. Now, in men that are uncircumcised, they have this and it pulls back during ejaculation or during the uh, copulation. Uh, and then uh, men that have been circumcised, circumcised actually have this uh, prepus actually removed. And so it is, uh, they're circumcised. And so this skin is no longer there. And so that's the difference between circumcised and uncircumcised in these situations. And again, a lot of times circumcision was done as a health reason, but nowadays that they find that it's not necessarily done. And so it's a choice on whether not the parents want their uh, um, male childs to be circumcised or not. And again, it used to be more of a religious type of thing and then also uh, advised just for a hygiene type of issue. But we find that it's not always necessary and that it, it doesn't necessarily have to be done in those things. But again, it's more of a parental choice uh, when the baby, uh, the male child is delivered and that stuff. And they ask whether or not the child, you want the child to be circumcised or not. So again, uh, it's totally up to the parents and that stuff. And I'm not going to point one way or the other in those situations, but that's, that's just one of the things that you know about. Okay. And then if we look at the female structures, again, the external female structures include the clitoris and the two sets of labia, which are the skin folds on the outside. And again, the internal organs include a pair of gonads, which are the ovaries, the system of ducts and chambers that carry the gametes and then house the embryo. And then finally the fetus, which is the uh, uterus. And then again, the vaginas for the reception of the penis and that for sexual reproduction. Now the female uh, gonads are the ovaries and they lie in the abdominal cavity. And again, this is a kind of a cool picture because you can kind of see the follicles developing. And again, the follicles, which are the partially developed egg uh, called the oocyte. And eventually what happens is each month, one of these follicles will rupture and release the egg and it will pass down the uterine tube where it will be fertilized by the sperm inside the uterine tube. And so again, that's where fertilization typically takes place is in the fallopian tube or uterine tube. And then the embryo makes its way down and implants in the uterus for a healthy pregnancy. Now again, during ovulation, the mature egg cell is released, travels through the oviduct, and again, the cilia in the oviduct move the egg down to the uterus. Now, fertilization does take place in the oviduct. And then the embryo, once it becomes to that stage, which is after two cell stage of development, will work its way down to the uterus where it will implant in. And again, during that time, hormones will sti uh, stimulate and uh, again, increase the lining of the endometrium. Uh, with the bl uh, with blood and nourishment for the developing embryo. And then again, this uh, head of the uh, uterus is called the cervix. And typically there is a mucus plug there to prevent things from getting in. So again, bacteria from the vagina can't get in because typically there's a little plug that prevents things from getting in. 
during the time of ovulation, that mucus gets thin so that the sperm can travel in and then cause for fertilization. But so, most of the time, there's a lining, like I said, of mucus to prevent things from traveling in. And so typically, the uterus is sterile uh, compared to the vagina, which is teeming with lots of microorganisms in this case. Okay, now the vagina is the muscular but elastic chamber that is the repository for sperm and during combination and then also serves as a birth canal and then it opens to the vulva which contains the labia majora, labia minora, the hymen and clitoris and again you can see all those structures there which are typically what you think of with the external uh, genitalia. Now, another part of the females is the mammary gland, especially in uh, females uh, fe or female uh, mammals and that stuff. And I just wanted to point out that the mammary glands are very similar, whether you're talking about a cow or a human. And so you can see here, the mammary glands look very similar, that there are these uh, important glands, these small sacs of epithelial tissue that do secrete milk. You can see these glands here in the udder of a cow. And again, you have what is the teat and again, the follicles that release the milk out. And the same thing is true here. You have again, the uh, lobes of the mammary glands in the female uh, human. And again, they're connected to the, the tubes, which then lead to the uh, 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 lactiferous sinus, which then again brings this milk to the nipple and again for breastfeeding in that in those situations. So again, very similar uh, again in the mammals when you look at the different types of mammary glands that are there. Now the important part, like I said, is the development of these eggs. So now our eggs or, or sperm in whether, um, whether you're talking about male or female. And again, this process is called gametogenesis. And again, it's looking at how these cells develop. And so again, this is taking place whether we're talking about the testes in males or the uh, ovaries in females. And so again, what happens during gametogenesis is development of these cells. And so again, you have these, again, sporan sporangiums and spermatocytes, which are 2N through meiotic divisions. And then all of a sudden they will go through the first stage of meiosis. And remember meiosis, is a reduction in the number of cells. So hopefully you had a good lecture in genetics, if it wasn't me, that someone else taught you that during meiosis, you actually reduce the number of cells because, or reduce the number of chromosomes because you can only have half the chromosomes because that's one of the points is you wanna have half the chromosomes so when you fuse the two together, you don't have double the chromosomes in the child. So you wanna have half and half so it goes together to make a whole. And so meiosis means reduction and division. And so the first stage you have reduction and then you have division after that and you perform uh, form four single uh, N cells. And again, these could be all uh, variant, uh, genetically variant in the case, because again, you have the different uh, possibilities in this situation. You make the mature sperm. And again, it kind of works from the outside in, in the set of tubules. So again, when we look at the sperm, or um, look at the testes, testes are those tubules. And again, the seminiferous tubules, you have the tubules. And in the inside, you have these stem cells on the very outside of the tubule. And as you work your way in, you go through the process of meiosis, you go through these uh, meiotic, meiotic divisions, and then when it gets to the bottom, you get the mature sperm. And so we could pull these slides out, and maybe we will during sexual reproduction, taking a look at the uh, what the testes look like. But typically, you can see cells and layers of cells, and then in the middle, you see the tails. And so you actually see the sperm tails because they gain their tails and then they form this little body. And so that's at the final step of maturation is actually forming the head and then the long tails that are associated with it. And so that's typically what you see with the gametogenesis. Now again, spermatogenesis is the development of sperm. It's continuous and prolific throughout the rest of the life of males once they hit puberty. Millions of sperm are produced every day. Each sperm takes about seven weeks to develop. And so again, it takes time for this to develop, but the numbers, the sheer numbers of sperm are in the millions every day. And so men do this ever, as soon as they hit puberty, they get the hormone signal to start producing sperm and they will produce mature sperm to the day they die. And so that's one of the differences between men and women is that again, men will produce sperm when they're sexually active at the age of probably between 10 and 12. And again, they will produce sperm, mature sperm to the day they die. Now in females, they have what is called oogenesis. And again, it's the development of the mature egg. 
Interesting things that happen is first, this uh, set of meiosis takes place at the uh, early on during development. So when the ovaries are developing, you go through this set of meiotic divisions and then you get the primary oocyte, which essentially gets arrested at uh, the prophase of meiosis one. And then starting at puberty, you then go through meiosis one and then every month you release the egg. And so I, I, essentially what happens is that it gets arrested at metas, metaphase two and then during ovulation, you start releasing these eggs. And so they're really at meiosis two. If they get fertilized, then they will then go through the rest of meiosis and then become fertilized, fertilized eggs. If they do not get fertilized, then what gets ovulated every month is a egg cell that's basically stopped or arrested at the metaphase of meiosis two, where the chromosomes are actually split. And so it's really not even a mature egg cell that gets released every month. It's one that's, uh, again, arrested at meiosis two, and it doesn't finish the cycle unless it gets fertilized. And so that's the only time that you actually see the full, full production of going into the meiosis two. Now, the oocyte does develop inside a follicle, and you can see that follicle gets larger and larger. And then at the time of ovulation, this follicle ruptures and releases the egg. And we're gonna look at the hormones that cause that. And then the ruptured follicle will actually produce this corpus luteum, which actually produces hormones. And then eventually it degrades inside the ovary. And so women go through this every month to do ovulation. Some women actually can feel this or have pain associated with the rupture or follicle. They feel it and that stuff. And so they do experience uh, uh, essentially um, ovulation in that case. So they can kind of tell when they're ovulating. Some women have no sensation whatsoever. And so again, those that can actually feel it can kind of help themselves with pregnancy because they kind of know when they're ovulating and then they'll be ready to go for pregnancy right around that time. And so again, uh, that that's one of the benefits of being able to feel it. But again, a lot of times you can calculate your cycle based on, again, your period and uh, your menstruation cycles and that stuff. And you can kind of look at, again, not only hormone levels, but also temperature and temperature increases during ovulation as well. And so that's another way to look at that. Now, oh, and the other thing to mention about female uh, oogenesis is that it only happens for so long, and then eventually you go through what is called menopause, and I actually have a slide here in a few minutes. So again, looking at the differences, so spermatogenesis differs in oogenesis in three ways. First, in spermatogenesis, all four products are made, and so again, you make all four products, you make all four sperm, whereas in females, you only make one egg cell. Again, spermatogenesis occurs throughout adolescence and adulthood as soon as they hit puberty. This continues on until the day they die. And then again, sperm are produced continuously without prolonged interruptions, where oogenesis, there's these stoppages. So essentially what happens is the first stage of oogenesis is arrested during development. And then the second stage of oogenesis is arrested during uh, until ovulation and then, like I said, fertilization triggers the finishing product uh, through meiosis too in that and looking at it. So again, during puberty, you go through um, meiosis one to reduce the number and then it rests where you have again a rest of the cells until it goes through uh, meiosis two. And then, like I said, it stops at metaphase two and then doesn't occur until you get fertilization of the egg in that case, and that's gonna be the, the situation there. Now, like I said, the tropic and sex hormones do regulate the release of these different things, and again, the release of sperm and making sperm, and then the release in, in, uh, release of the oocyte going through. Now, the two hormones that are, again, mammalian reproduction is coordinated by the hormones of the hypothalamus, the anterior, uh, pituitary and the gonads. And so the first thing that gets released is the gonadotropin releasing hormone. It's secreted by the hypothalamus, which causes the release of this LH, which is luteinizing hormone, and then the FSH, which is the follicle stimulating hormone. And again, that uh, is a positive stimulus for testes and ovaries, which will start producing testosterone and estrogens and progesterone, which will then uh, actually stop the pituitary from producing LH and FSH as well as gonadotropic hormone as well. And so again, we see these cyclings of hormones uh, during the time of reproduction. And so we look at that. Now again, these guys stimulate the production of the sex hormones. And again, the major and androgen in men is testosterone. 
and the major estrogen is estradiol and progesterone. Both uh, males and females do produce both of these, but they differ in the concentrations of hormones. And just to give you an example, males produce 10 times the amount of testosterone than females. And again, they do have the effect. And so this just kind of shows you the negative feedback of testosterone on the rest of the body, that it shuts down the gonadotropin and the LH and FHH for stimulation of sperm cells in this case. And females, again, progesterone and estrogen are also a negative uh, feedback of the gonadotropin hormone and then the LH and FSH for the production. And again, you're going to see these cycles and why this is why this is important. Now, males do produce a little bit of estrogen, and again, things can affect that. And so we know there are certain chemicals out there that can lead to the production of more estrogen. And so when that happens, you do start to see female characteristics in men. So you start to see development of breasts. And again, some other, other situations, you may see, see a lowering of the voice in that. Uh, in females, if they start to get testosterone, they take, start taking on male characteristics where, again, in this situation, breast tissue gets reduced. Again, you start to see a deepening of the voice and then the production of, of hair, especially facial hair and other things on the body. And so they start to start picking up more male characteristics. And again, we've seen situations where Again, where people take steroids, where again, more testosterone develop more musculature in that, and especially in females, you start to see more male-like characteristics. And again, people that want to switch, so like it, like if they're you know one of those that, one of those people that are are not I wouldn't say confused, but are um, one of those people that are I would say sexually misaligned with what they think they are in that, and so they can take hormones to again, develop more female characteristics or male characteristics in which they feel more comfortable being. So if they were a male that wanted to be a female, they could take hormones and again, start expressing more female-like characteristics. And likewise, male or females that wanted to be more male-like, again, could take testosterone and develop more male-like qualities. And so that is the possibility for those that are uh, gender neutral or gender, uh, you know, gen again, gender uh, changing type of thing in those situations. So that's the way that I would look at that and, and talk about that. And again, these hormones can cause, uh, these androgens can cause the development of other uh, additional functions, including sexual behavior and primary and sex, uh, secondary sex characteristics. And again, one of the things that androgens do in male is do male vocalizations and courtship dis displays to attract the females. And again, in birds, we also see development of color, especially in male feathers and that stuff to promote to females saying, hey, look at me, I'm a great mate, mate with me type of thing. And so you do see that in birds as well. Now, what do FSH and LH do on the males? And so again, in this situation, they uh, act differently on the cells of the testes and direct spermatogenesis. So there's two types of cells. There's the Sortoli cells, which are found in the seminiferous tubules. And so these cells help respond by FSH by nourishing and developing the sperm. And again, allowing for the spermatocytes to develop into mature sperm, so you see that. And then you see the Leydig cells, which are on the outside in the connective tissue, help respond by LH by secreting uh, testosterone and, under, and other androgens would help permit spermatogenesis. And so again, as men age, they lose testosterone. And so one of the things is that the loss of sexual drive as uh, men age. And so one of the things uh, they can do is stimulate, uh, again, testosterone production. Uh, due to the loss or replacement of testosterone to bring sexual drive back. And so that's one of the things we do see uh, when um, men do get older, they do lose testosterone production in that over time. And so that may affect the sexual or the ability to reproduce later on in life. Now, again, in, in the male reproductive system, there is the two negative feedback mechanisms that control sex hormone production. Testosterone regulates the production of both the gonadotropin and the FH and LH. Uh, and so these things will shut these things down. And again, there's also the inhibin, which reduces FHH secretion from the anterior uh, and which can also cause some negative feedback as well. So here's the inhibin by the Sertoli cells and then the Leydig cells to uh, secrete testosterone, which can then shut down the production of these two hormones. And again, to lower the response. And so again, they want 
a constant production but not overwhelming production and so that's why you have these negative feedback mechanisms now in females they have a very I would say a more complex cycle again and again the two cycles that they tend to ha that they have are the ovarian cycle and the menstrual cycle uh, which is also known as the uterine cycle and so the ovarian cycle is looking at the development of the follicle and then the egg being released and so you have the follicular phase and the luteal phase depending on what's going on there and then you have the menstrual cycle which is the uterine lining so that again is called the uterine cycle and so what you're looking at is menstruation proliferative and then the secretory phase and that's again getting the uterus ready to accept uh, the developing embryo and so that's what's going on in these situations now during each cycle the endometrium thickens with blood vessels in prepar preparation for embryo implantation and again if the oocyte is not fertilized or fertilized and pregnancy does not occur the lining is shed and sloughed off and that's called menstruation and so this just kind of gives you a quick look of what's happening again looking at the two ovarians looking at the egg cell development and then the uterine cycle is looking at the proliferation of the endometrium in the uterus. And so, again, that's what's going on there. And so, again, looking at these two different things. Now, again, the gonadotropin from the hypothalamus is secreting the FH and LH. And you can see the levels go up during the time of ovulation. And so they reach a point where the LH surges and triggers ovulation. And so if you go back to that one slide, looking at this, the LH kind of smacks the follicle to release the egg. And so it smacks it, releases the egg, and then you get production of the, um, of the luteal and the corpus luteus here, or the corpus luteum, and again, secreting progesterone in that for the development of the egg in the, um, in the uterus itself. So again, that's what's going on here. So the LH signals uh, release of the egg from the follicle along with the FHH and then it goes back down and so again you're going to have the positive and negative uh, feedback based on those different things and again production of these different types of things and so the slow rise in estradiol secretion occurs during most of the follicular phase and so when estradiol secretion begins to rise slowly these these go up and then you get the release of like I said the peak which is ovulation, which is about 14 days in the menstrual cycle. And so you get ovulation, and then again, the egg then starts to travel down the fallopian tubes, and then you have the leftover follicle, which will then now start producing hormones to getting ready for pregnancy. And again, this is one of those things. And this is called the luteal phase, because again, the secretion of progesterone and estradiol secreted by the corpus luteum to help support the, the developing oocyte, and hopefully the uh, if if it's wanted, obviously the pregnancy and the embryo as it's working its way down into the uterus. And so again, that's going to be the cycle there. Again, the uterine or menstrual cycle, again, you get the developing or thickening of the endometrium that continues to get larger and larger. You can see progesterone helps with the uh, thickening of the lining as well as the estradiol. Again, the peak uh, allows for the release and this is getting the tissue ready for exception uh, or the reception of the embryo once it implants and then it will develop and we'll talk more about that during development in that but again you have this and then if there is no oocyte or uh, fertilized egg then what you get is essentially the menstrual flow which starts on day one and that's the shedding of the lining and getting it ready to do the cycle all over again and so again that describes pretty much the process that happens in females. So again, you get these different levels of hormones, again, to trigger one, ovulation, and then two, uh, the development of the endometrium, which again, if there's no egg for or embryo ready to be accepted, and then the shedding of the lining occurs, and then again, that would be called menstruation. Now, like I mentioned before, one of the big differences is men can go through spermatogenesis the rest of their life. Women are on a limited number, and so they say about 500 cycles of the menstrual cycle, the uterine, uh, uterine cycle, and then the follicle cycle take place. And then you get what is called menopause, which is essentially the sensation of ovulation and menstruation. And again, menopause is very unusual among animals, and so only a few actually do this. And it's probably due to the life cycle or how long uh humans live in that stuff where you see it more than other animals because again lifespans are a little bit shorter but they believe menopause might be evolved to allow for the mother to better care for her children and grandchildren so that once she's had her offspring she can care for them and not worry about having more offspring to take care of and that stuff and then especially as she ages then she can take care of her children's children and that stuff as the grandchildren 
come along. And so that's the idea. And again, here's some of the symptoms associated with this. And so that this is one of the common issues with women going through menopause. And again, looking at all these different situations and what happens uh, during this time. Okay, so again, when we look at menstrual cycles, which are typically characteristic of only humans and other primates, so again, the difference is, is that the endometrium is shed through the uterus and bleeding called menstruation. And again, sexual re receptivity is not limited to a time frame. So again, humans and other primates can really have a baby at almost any time of the year because again, they don't go through this cycle where, where they um, only are reproductively active at this time. Most other mammals have what is called estrous cycles. And this is characteristic of most mammals, again, the endometrium gets reabsorbed by the uterus, and so they don't have the process of menstruation, and they only have a limited amount of time called the heat period. And again, the length and frequency of estrous cycles varies from species to species, but you can see the estrous cycle is typically anywhere from about 20 to 30 days, and again, it can be very seasonal. Some can be polyesterous, meaning that they have multiple ones during the year, but a lot of species do only uh, mate at certain times of the year. And again, ovulation takes place very soon. And then the length of pregnancy can vary from 100 days up to almost 300 or a little over 300 days. And again, humans kind of fall in between at about 270 days or maybe a few more days depending on how long. But again, it's more like a cow than a uh, pig in this situation. Pigs only take about 115 days where humans and cows are about the same at about 270, 280 days of uh, pregnancy. And so that's another thing that you see. Now again, with the human sexual response, what allows for sexual reproduction to happen, essentially you have two reactions that predominate in both sexes. One, you get vasocongestion, the filling of tissue with blood, and they have myotonia, which is the increased muscle tension. And again, the sexual response cycle has four phases, which is excitement, plateau, orgasm, and resolution. And again, excitement prepares the penis and vagina for coitus. And again, that's sexual intercourse for those that didn't know that, if you haven't watched the Big Bang Theory and that stuff. And so these kind of keep the organs ready. And then you have orgasm and then you have resolution where, again, sex is stopped. And so, again, direct stimulation of the genitalia uh, gets the excitement phase going. And then you have plateau. And again, comparing males to females, typically males can only have one orgasm at a time. And then they have resolution where females could have... Um, multiple orgasms uh, in those situations, or they may have resolution without orgasm where they may not uh, reach orgasm uh, in that stuff, and that's very common uh, type of thing. And again, orgasm is characterized by rhythmic contraction of the reproductive structures. Again, in males, orgasm happens as released when uh, semen is released from in, or released from the urethra and then ejaculated into the urethra. In females, the uterus and outer vagina do contract during orgasm, and so you do see that contraction sometimes. Uh, again, and it, and for females, it's not necessary to uh, hit that for resolution. For men, orgasm, and then you have resolution, which is where again the blood drains from the uh, the organs. Of sexual organs. Again, the resolution phase, organs return to their normal state and the muscles relax. And again, you can see that here in the sexual response cycle. Okay, one of the last things we'll talk about is contraception. And so again, blocking the, the ability. And so again, may, or humans are one of the few uh, species that actually can control whether or not they're going to get pregnant or not, because again, we can have sex pretty much throughout the year. And so, again, we're one of the few animals that actually have sex for enjoyment, not just for reproductive purposes and that. And again, contraception is a big thing because not every time you want to get pregnant. And so this is the deliberate prevention of pregnancy, and it can be achieved in a number of ways. And so one of them could be just the simple vasectomy where, you, again, you cut the tubes so that sperm can't uh, be transported down the male duct system. Uh, again, you can talk about birth control, which can uh, prevent the uh, production of oocytes so you don't get ovulation in these situations and that stuff. Uh, there are other things that can be done as well. Uh, one of the more common ones is abstinence, obviously preventing sperm from traveling down so you don't have that a condom for blocking the sperm from reaching the uh, outside. Uh, the vagina for collection of the sperm. 
And then the other one would be, uh, again, there is the female condom, which can prevent sperm from reaching the female parts as well that the female can wear. Now, one of the interesting ones is the coitus interruptus. And again, that would be what is also termed as the pullout method, which again is not very, not very good because some of the secretions before uh, the final ejacula ejaculation do contain sperm. And so sperm still make it in there. And sometimes it's not very, it's a lot of times not very successful. And so it's not one of the ways to, if you were trying to prevent pregnancy, the way to go <laughs> type of thing about doing it. Now, there are other ways uh, that again can happen. There are spermicides, diaphragms that can prevent sperm uh, from making it into the, uh, the uterus. Again, there can be tubal ligation where, again, you tie the tubes so that the oocyte cannot make it down the oviduct and the sperm cannot make it up. So that could also happen. And again, then you have, again, the meeting of the sperm uh, in the oocyte and the oviduct where you can have the morning after pill or a uterine device which will block the sperm from actually unionizing with the egg. And we'll show you that here in just a second as well. So again, the idea is keeping the sperm and egg apart. If you can do that, you've achieved uh, normal uh, contraception. Again, the rhythm method is a natural family plan planning, which is temporary abstinence when conception is most likely. So avoiding ovulation, times of ovulation. The same can be true with natural family planning. If you want to have uh, a family, is to have sex during the time of ovulation or right around that time so that you increase your chances of having uh, pregnancy. Now, again, pregnancy rate is anywhere from 10 to 20%. Uh, by doing that. Now the coitus interruptus, like I said, is the withdrawal of the penis before ejaculation, but this is unreliable. Like I said, secretions that are before still contain sperm and that happens uh, in that. And so it's not a really good way of doing um, or preventing pregnancy or contraception. And then the barrier methods block fertilization that have a pregnancy rate less than 10%. Again, condoms uh, are very common or a diaphragm, which again, prevent the sperm from reaching the egg or getting into the vagina and that, uh, or I'm uh, not the vagina, but in this case, sperm either getting to the egg, sort of blocking it from the male end or in the female end, catching the sperm before it gets uh, to the uterus and that stuff. And so that's the other way of doing that. Now, I mentioned some inner uterine uh, devices as well, the IUDs, and those are inserted uh, by a doctor. And so what they do are these little thing, these little tabs that actually fit in and they block the fallopian tubes. And so again, those are another way to prevent pregnancy. So the sperm can't get up and the eggs can't get down. And so you don't have that. And again, pregnancy rate is less than 1%. Sometimes a little sperm can sneak in and you still get uh, the egg traveling through or it may come dislodged or that as well. And then fem female birth control pills obviously prevent uh, the release of the oocyte. And so the pregnancy rate falls less than 1% in those situations. So you can be sexually active and be on the pill and not get pregnant that way. Because again, it prevents, by releasing hormones, prevents release or ovulation of the egg during the follicular phase of, of the women's cycle. Okay, so that's just a couple of different ways to uh, block pregnancy in that. Now, some people do experience infertility, and again, it's about 1 in 10 couples, so about 10% of couples uh, that try to get pregnant can't get pregnant. And so, and this is about worldwide as well, in the United States worldwide, and their causes are very and equally likely to affect men and women. And so the common thing is, is that they say about a third of the time they think it's the female, a third of the time it's the male, and a third of the time it's either one, and they don't know really who's doing that, and that's kind of what the doctors will say. And again, it could be things like past cancers that have affected, again, chemotherapy, destroying rapidly dividing cells because they can have effect on the testes and the ovaries, uh, smoking and drinking, uh, irregular periods, history of STDs we know can scar the fallopian tubes and the urethra, obesity, it can be an issue in losing weight, um, and then age. Age is a big issue, and again, as women are getting older, uh, a lot of times we're waiting to get pregnant. We're seeing more infertility due to that because they're waiting too long. And again, I think I mentioned this in class before, over the age of 35, you're considered senior citizen in the idea of having pregnancy. And so after the age of 35, you're considered high risk and you're more likely to have either genetic abnormalities uh, with pregnancy. You are going to have more of a higher chance of losing a pregnancy uh, during the course of pregnancy and then even getting pregnant in those places in in those places as well and so there are a number of factors that can affect uh, this and cause infertility 
Now, one way that you can uh, increase your chances, especially if you're older uh, in that, or there's an issue with uh, the tubes and that stuff, you can do one of the things called, uh, again, hormone therapy, which can increase both the sperm and egg production. And so we do know that you can take certain drugs uh, like Clomid and some of these other ones that can increase the likelihood of getting pregnant because what Clomid will do is increase the amount of ovulation that can occur. So not only do you ovulate one egg, but you ovulate two or three eggs at a time. And so that's one of the drugs that can take so over ovulation. Or you can do a thing like in vitro fertilization where again what they do is they overstimulate the ovaries with uh, LH and again giving injections and then what the doctor will do is come in and remove all the eggs that are ready to be um, ovulated so they move remove that out before ovulation they pull those out and then they uh, collect those eggs and then they mix that with the sperm they mix those two together and then they develop and uh, in the developing egg so they can either do it naturally in the dish where the sperm and egg will meet, or they can inject the sperm into the egg as well. And so there's one of two ways they can do that to ensure ovulation occurs. They look for embryo development and make sure that their embryos are healthy. Then they take the healthy embryos and then inject that back into the urethra called an embryo transfer, and hopefully that it um, binds on. And typically they'll do more than one embryo and the reason for that is so that they have a higher success at pregnancy. And so again, you may not, you may put in three or four embryos rather than just one if they're available. And so again, you look at how many embryos are available. Some places will do one or two if they have a high success rate. Again, looking at the age of the mother and other things, or they may choose to do more just to increase the odds of actually getting pregnant. And so that's the that's the idea with in vitro fertilization. You can kind of see this happening here. And again, there are a number of other methods as well. I'm not going to get into all those today, but you can go and research that. Obviously, if there is any issue with infertility uh, in that stuff, and you can look at some of the other treatments that are out there. And again, success rate depends on the age of the mother. Um, again, how viable are the sperm and the egg? and a number of other things, other other factors that are out there and that stuff. And so again, you can you can do the research and look into that and, and look at success rates of clinics and that stuff around in this area. Okay. And so we made it to the end of this discussion. Hopefully you got something out of it. Hopefully you learned a little bit more about sex between the sexual and asexual reproduction and some of the things that are there. Again, we talked about asexual and sexual reproduction again occurring in the animal kingdom. Most of the time, eukaryotes select sexual because of the variation. And so, again, not only plants, but also animals do sexual reproduction because it increases the genetic variance. Even though you get better numbers in asexual reproduction, numbers of offspring, but they're going to be just like the parent. And so sexual reproduction, even though it requires more, the advantage is, is that you get more variation and a diverse population are more likely to survive an environmental change. And that's the big thing. Again, we talked about the reproductive organs that produce and transport gametes. Again, in females, it's the ovaries. In males, it's the testes. And again, the organs that help precipitate that along or in that and, and facultate, I should say, not precipitate, but facultate that along. And we looked at that especially and very similar in most mammals and that stuff. And then we also looked at the hormones, the uh, gonadotropin hormone, which stimulates the pituitary to produce the luteinizing hormone and then the uh, the other hormone that I can't think of it right now, the follicle stimulating hormone, the FSH. And so those are the two hormones that stimulate the gonads and again, producing the androgen uh, steroids like the testosterone and the estrogen to uh, stimulate production. And again, we saw the different cycles that go on. Okay. And with that, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. We can have a great discussion on that. Again, if you want to talk more about uh, again, some of the ways of infertility or some of these other things that are out there, feel free to ask and that stuff. Uh, otherwise, if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, again, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.